Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're tackling obstructive shock. Let's jump in with our practice question to get it started as always. So the nurse assesses a client three hours following cardiac surgery and assessment findings were a BP of 88 over 52, some jugular venous distension and muffled heart sounds. The nurse anticipates this client will need an immediate A, thoracentesis, B, pericardiocentesis, C, atherocentesis, or D, a paracentesis. So think that through and tuck away what you think might be the answer for the end of the episode. We will circle back, but first, before we get really specific, I want to make sure you guys understand exactly what shock itself is. We've talked about this in previous episodes with hypovolemic shock, but I'm going back to the basics again. Shock occurs when our cells just don't get enough oxygen. Every cell in your body depends on oxygen to generate energy. And this process is called aerobic metabolism. It's the most efficient way to make this energy, which is ATP, the energy currency that keeps us moving and grooving. When we don't have enough oxygen going to the cell, they cannot do aerobic metabolism. That requires oxygen. So our cells are forced to switch into something called anaerobic or without oxygen metabolism. Anaerobic metabolism can still make ATP. This is our emergency backup plan. But it makes a lot less ATP. And the major downside it comes with is producing lactate. This byproduct lactate is an acid. So it builds up and leads to metabolic acidosis. So essentially... Anytime y'all see lactate in a patient's blood, you should be thinking shock because what's going on is cells not getting oxygen. It's switching to anaerobic metabolism. It's making lactate as a byproduct. Okay, so we're clear. Shock equals cells don't get enough oxygen. But how does that happen? We have three main components to the cardiovascular system. We have our heart, the pump, the blood vessel, the pipes, and the blood that is those fluids going in the pipes. And shock can happen with any one of those components breaking. Okay, in our very first episode, we didn't have enough fluid. The fluid was broken, and that led to hypovolemic shock. In cardiogenic shock, we talked about the pump, the heart breaking, and that stopping oxygen from where it needs to go. Today, we're talking about obstructive shock which is a problem with our heart, our pump. But it's not the same thing as with cardiogenic shock. In cardiogenic shock, that heart is too weak to pump blood forward so the cells don't get enough oxygen. In obstructive shock, the pump, the heart, isn't necessarily weak, but it is blocked. I like to think of the left ventricle leading out into the aorta as some sort of doorway. And in obstructive shock, it is jammed. The heart totally wants to do its job. It is trying to push that blood forward and get oxygen out to our cells. But it can't. Something's blocking the way. The door is jammed. That heart is being physically restricted from filling or pumping blood out effectively. So blood's not moving through the system like it should. And the end result is the same. The tissues don't get oxygen. The cells go into anaerobic metabolism. Lactate starts to rise. We have shock. So what causes the door to jam? Our classic examples are a cardiac tamponade where fluid or blood fills that pericardial sac, squeezing it so it can't fill properly. A tension pneumothorax. So that's air trapped in the chest. And that air trapped in the chest pushes on the heart and the major vessels so they can't fill up and pump forward. And then three, a massive pulmonary embolism. When we have a blood clot blocking blood flow from the right side of the heart into the lungs. All three of these can cause that backup. The heart can't fill the way it's supposed to. Blood can't move forward. Oxygen doesn't get delivered. And you guessed it, we start to see shock. So recap, obstructive shock, 
equals the heart is intact, but it cannot function because it's being blocked. And if we don't relieve that obstruction, the heart cannot deliver oxygen to the body and we start to go into shock. So with that, let's walk ourselves through a little scenario here. This is a story back from my emergency department days. It was a young gentleman. I honestly don't remember his exact age. He was in his early 20s. And other than being a very heavy smoker, he was a construction worker. He was totally healthy. He had no past medical history. He didn't go to his doctor very regularly. But when he showed up to the ED, he had just come from the job site drove himself right over because all of a sudden he had really severe epigastric pain. He's like, I was fine one minute. The next minute, the pain was so bad, I couldn't bear it. And we knew, you know, kind of typical young 20s, doesn't go to the doctor a lot. He's driving himself to the ED. He's feeling really bad. He's also telling me like this sudden onset epigastric pain is radiating to his back. So that made me a little bit nervous. I'm like, okay, pain radiating, not a good thing. He did say it's a little bit better when I lean forward, but he is still like diaphoretic, sweating, having trouble talking. He's in so much pain. So of course we put him on the monitor. Triage did that before they brought him back to me. I was actually not in triage that day. So the vital signs I got from triage, his heart rate was tacky in the 130s. BP was a little soft at 90s over 70s. His oxygen, surprisingly, was at 89. So that was definitely lower than I was expecting. You could tell he was in pain. He told you it was centered in that upper abdomen, and he was short of breath. It was hard for him to keep talking. He was like, oh, it's just the pain. But you could tell he was, like, having trouble taking a big breath. Now, of course, abdominal pain, my first assessment is of his abdomen. He wasn't guarding, no rigidity, no fever, so no like immediate red flags of an abdominal catastrophe. By the time he gets back to me, we've already sent out some labs. They come back pretty quick. He's got like a little bit of a white count, not so much that I think he's septic or anything. And honestly, most of his other labs are normal. H&H is fine. He's not bleeding from anywhere. His inflammatory markers aren't super elevated. So they go ahead and do an abdominal x-ray. The doc was thinking maybe there's some free air in his belly and that's causing this intense pain. But surprise, surprise, it actually wasn't his belly. He had a right-sided tension pneumo. So let's walk this back for a second because I was not expecting a tension pneumo coming from belly pain. In a tension pneumothorax, Air is building up in the pleural space of the lungs, okay? So that outer lining of the lungs to help reduce friction when we breathe in and out, we're getting air in there. And there is no way for it to go out. So it just starts collapsing the lung. It just presses in on it. And it doesn't stop there. That trapped air starts shifting the entire mediastinum to the other side. It's pressing on the heart, compressing the great vessels, compressing the heart. It is pushing so hard on the heart that the heart cannot fill up with blood. It is decreasing venous return. And if we're not filling the heart up, we can't pump blood forward. So we are obstructing the flow of blood out of the heart. That is obstructive shock. So his vital signs are starting to make sense. Low blood pressure because super poor preload. We're not getting venous return because the heart is being compressed by this massive tension pneumothorax. He's tacky because the body is trying to compensate. The heart is trying to beat faster to get blood out, but there's no blood filling it up since it's all compressed from this massive tension pneumo. Okay, so what do we got to do? Obstructive shock is mechanical. There is something blocking that blood flow. We got to relieve the blockage. So... For a tension pneumo, it is a needle decompression. We need to stick a needle into that pleural space and let the air out. No, we're waiting. We're not getting a CT or doing labs. The trapped air has got to go. And as soon as the physician did that needle decompression, whew, we heard air go out. He could take a big breath. His heart could fill again. Oxygen improved. His heart rate came down. His blood pressure came up. And for him, the belly pain 
totally went away. It was a very odd presentation for attention pneumo, but when that pleural space filled up with air, it pushed on the lung, it pushed on everything else too, and for this guy, manifested as epigastric pain. So now after the needle decompression, they went ahead and put a chest tube in, and I think it was about three to four days that he was admitted with that chest tube before they pulled it and were able to discharge him, but he went home completely recovered. So that needle decompression worked because it unblocked the door, right? We were trying to get blood out of the heart. It was jammed shut because of that compression of the heart from the lungs. We let that air out. We took care of that door jam. The heart could fill up with blood and send it forward again. So tension pneumo, trapped air, the door is jammed, and we got to decompress it. Now, what if it had been like a cardiac tamponade? Well, in that case, the fluid in the pericardial sac would be filling up and compressing the heart, that door jamming it. So we have to relieve that pressure. That's a pericardiocentesis. Needle into the pericardium, take out the fluid, let the heart expand again. So your key takeaway is it's not cardiogenic shock where you have to make the heart pump harder. You just need to unblock the jam. It's not a heart problem. It's a pressure problem. If it is a tension pneumothorax, we got to do a needle decompression, relieve the jam from those lungs. If it is a cardiac tamponade, we need to do a pericardiocentesis, relieve the door jam from that fluid in the sac of the heart, okay? So relieve that pressure, open the door. That is the goal and how we fix obstructive shock. So with that being said, let's wrap it up with our practice question and see if you know the right answer and why. The nurse assesses a client three hours after cardiac surgery. They have a BP of 88 over 52, JVD, muffled heart sounds. What does the nurse anticipate? Thoracentesis, pericardiocentesis, atherocentesis, or a paracentesis? They need some sort of thesis. Which one is it? Say it out loud with me if you're driving in the car, walking to class. What do you think? It is B, pericardiocentesis. You saw the classic signs of obstructive shock where heart rate went up, blood pressure went down, and then you also saw JVD and muffled heart sounds. Those are the classic indicators of a cardiac tamponade. We've got fluid filling up in that pericardial sac around the heart. Okay, so that's jamming the door. It's squeezing in on the heart and the heart cannot push its blood forward. So we got to relieve that pressure with a cardiac tamponade. It's a pericardiocentesis. That's where we insert a needle into the pericardial cavity and drain out that fluid. Now, A, that thoracentesis, that's that needle aspiration, usually for a pleural effusion, okay? So that is taking fluid off, but it's from the lungs. It is not from the heart, and we're suspecting a cardiac tamponade based on those clinical findings. Now, C, an atherocentesis is the puncturing of a joint with a needle where we withdraw synovial fluid, so not applicable in this scenario. And then D, a paracentesis, that's when we get fluid from the belly, from the peritoneum, like when we have ascites, and we use it for diagnostic testing. Or if we've got a bunch of ascites and we're just trying to reduce that fluid that has accumulated and is causing respiratory difficulties or pain. But this client did not have ascites. Paracentesis, that's not treating obstructive shock due to cardiac tamponade. Remember, with obstructive shock, It is not the heart being weak. We don't have to make the heart pump harder. We got to unblock wherever the heart is jammed. It wants to work, but the door is blocked from getting blood out. And if we can't get blood out to the tissues, they won't have oxygen. They'll have to go into anaerobic metabolism. They'll make lactate and we will have shock. So your key takeaway in obstructive shock is to open up that door. It's cardiac tamponade. Do that pericardiocentesis. Get that fluid out. If it is a tension pneumo, then the provider is going to have to do that needle decompression. Decompress that lung so that we don't put pressure. We open up the door and our heart can actually push blood forward to the rest of the body. 
All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.